Hi, my name is Mark Olson, and I'm going to be presenting today on deriving uh, Runge Kutta methods. And the method we're going to be deriving is the second order method. Usually in classes, the fourth order method is presented, but the derivation is skipped because it takes so long. I don't have a criticism of that, but I think that there is some good pedagogical value in deriving one of the Runge Kutta methods at any rate to see how it's done. So we're given a initial value problem. We have our derivative of y, we have an interval we're interested in, and we have an initial value for y, and we would like to approximate y on this interval. With all problems of this type and this method of solving them, we are going to be taking time steps of h and approximating the function along the way. So what we do is we start with a Taylor expansion, something that you do solving many problems in calculus. So we are interested in finding y at h time in the future. So what do we do? We have constant term, linear term, quadratic term, error term. Basic Taylor expansion. Nothing funny going on. Now we're going to do a little bit of rewriting. We are going to pop an h out of these second terms here. So we get h standing out front, and we end up with this in the middle. Notice here that I'm using this definition. f is the same as y prime to put this here. And that means that y double prime should just be f prime. And we're left with our cubic error term in the back. Now, one of the goals of the Runge-Kutta method is we don't like taking these derivatives here. That is painful. So what we're going to do is we're going to replace it with something that looks like this, replacing this whole bracketed term. And through a clever choice of a, alpha, and beta, we are going to be able to avoid this derivative entirely, and we're going to get a rather good approximation for the bracketed term. So what do we do for this? It's going to involve some pattern matching. So first we need to change how this is written a little bit. This first term stays the same. We are taking f prime, so we're taking the partial of f with respect to t, and adding the partial of f with respect to y, but keeping in mind that the partial, that y itself is a function of t. So we end up with a y prime of t term here as well. And then these h over 2s, they just distribute in as you would expect. Next, Taylor expansion again. We are expanding this replacement term, and we're doing that in this line here. So we have our constant there. We have linear terms, but this is an expansion in two variables. So we have partial with respect to t. And then because we're taking a step of alpha away from t, we have that step of alpha there. Also partial with respect to y, and we're taking a step of size beta away from y, so we have the beta here. Um, in this case, notice that we're not, we're adding beta to y directly, so we don't have the um, chain rule going on. And then we're left with order two error in the back. Now we wanna do pattern matching. So we have these first terms, f and f, and those are almost the same already, so a, or they are the same already, so a is 1. Next, we have that a is 1. We want to match this term to this term. And so really, alpha is kind of set already. We see that alpha must be h over 2. And so that's what we set right here. Finally, again, we want to match this term, the partial with respect to y, to partial with respect to y. a is 1. So all we're left with is h over 2 times y prime it's mapped right onto beta. So we're left with these down here, one, h over two. And remember that y prime is defined to be f. So we're left with beta equals h over two times f t y. Now we're left with this line right here. We have our bracketed term is equal to a is one, alpha is h over two, beta is h over 2 times f of ty, and an order 2 error term. And so it looks like we are succeeding. We have gotten rid of this derivative, and we've gotten rid of it at the expense of evaluating f at two points now, instead of just one point. Continuing on, we're going to make the substitution. We have our y at time step h in the future, constant term multiplying by h, replacement term with the order h squared error. Now, notice that we're multiplying an h by an order h squared term. 
And so that'll come out and become part of our order h cubed we see here. And we're left with this method. This is how we're going to be stepping through time um, with this right here. And now you might be wondering, it's an order two room cut a method. Why do we have an order h cubed at the back? And that is because ab is fixed, right? And so when we decrease the size of h, uh, we are increasing the number of steps that we are taking to approximate y on that interval. So we are only making order of h cubed error per step, but we are taking order one over h steps. And so this gets us to our order h squared and what we call local truncation error. And this isn't a rigorous way to find the local truncation error, but it's a nice way to understand what that means, how that works. So if we were going to do something for a higher order, Rubin cut a method, the order three or order four, it'd be very similar. This Taylor expansion would be longer to begin with. We would have more parameters here, but the process would be more or less the same. Um, thank you.